Welcome to Shift Church. <laughs> if you're new today, we just wanted to say we're so glad that you decided to join us and you guys can go ahead and scan this QR code for all kinds of updates and information about us. Don't forget that after shift is tonight at 4.30, make sure you bring your lawn chairs, a side or a dessert for you and others, and make sure you bring your own drinks. We're gonna be grilling hot dogs and burgers and it's gonna be a blast. Our next second shift outing is gonna be to Defy on March 13th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. You can go ahead and scan the QR code now or at the welcome table to register and for all other information. That's all I have for you guys today. So let's go ahead and jump into week one of our Lent series, Remembering to Sacrifice. So uh, over the past few years, I have learned a lot about myself. Um, one of those things is that I, I care deeply about people, uh, but only care about the opinions of a few of them. And I don't mean that in some mean way. Uh, I, I just, I've just i just come to understand that um, a lot of uh, other people's opinions about me have more to do have more to do with them than they do about me, right? Um, I uh, I love uh, I love I love working out. I love exercising all kinds. Um, it helps center me. It, uh, I I feel off if I don't do it during the day. Uh, if I miss several days, I feel off. Um, I uh, I see the world uh, with a generous eye, right? Um, I see the good around us. I choose to see the good around us, uh, not ignoring all of the junk that is happening, right? Uh, but I do see the world, uh, even, even in moments like this, I still choose to try to find um, the good and the beautiful that's taking place. Um, I love to learn. I read like crazy. Um, for instance, right now, uh, I am learning about... Uh, uh, ancient humanities ontology and cosmology and how that affects um, the creation accounts of Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern people. I know. I'm, yes. I, I know it. I, I understand. But I, I try, and then, and then I'm like, babe, listen to this. I know you don't care, but. That's how it always starts. I know you don't care, but. Um, and then normally that's when she knows to just uh, tune me out. Um, uh, I am a sucker for a well-told story. All right, um, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, uh, love them. St almost anything by Stephen King. Um, Pierce Brown, uh, author of the Red Rising series, love them. Uh, I, and I just started uh, Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. Um, I love all of those types of books, these fantasy books where they're creating these worlds and stories are interwoven. And uh, Oh, and don't even get me started on the Marvel the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh my gosh, I'm going back and re-watching everything. People, why did nobody tell me about Daredevil and Luke Cage? I, I'm just now watching them for the very first time. And there's so many little things. And then on Thursday, Thursday, did you see the huge announcement what happened on Thursday? They announced Matt Reeves, the director of the new Batman movie, announced on Thursday that they're creating a Batverse with HBO Max, with all of these different spinoffs of Batman. I'm so excited. When I, when I saw it on TV, this was me. Like, I couldn't, this was like, if I could, that was me. That was me right there. That was me when I saw the Batverse uh, that was happening. Um, uh, well, maybe not the cigarette and whatnot. I mean, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and I think, I, you know, honestly, I think that's one of the reasons that I am drawn uh, to the stories of Jesus uh, and to the accounts of Jesus' life because they're very well-crafted, well-told stories, right? Like the, the, the authors were uh, very intelligent. They knew how to weave together this narrative. And, and, and as I look on out with everything that's, that's taking place uh, right now, um, I, w as we begin this new series that we're just— Literally, it's just Lent. It's uh, remembering his sacrifice. Um, and as we kind of go into that with everything that's going on, right, this season of preparation, um, it's these well-told stories and how it invites us to see our stories as part of that larger narrative. And then that larger narrative, then uh, complementing and informing and empowering our own stories on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to just, we're going to walk through the account written by a guy named Luke, all right? Um, super intelligent guy. He was a doctor. 
um, and he knows how to tell a story. Um, very, very ordered account, um, not chronologically. Um, and, and I will say, just as a reminder, I will say this as well, that the four different accounts of Jesus' life written by uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, aren't meant to be harmonized, right? It's not a chronological account of Jesus' life. They all had a different audience, and they all had di different agendas that they wanted to communicate to those specific audiences, all right? And, and today we're going to look at um, probably one of the more well-known stories of Jesus' life. Uh, it's his um, uh, temptation in the wilderness, and that's where we're going to be. We'll have it up here on the screen for you. It's Luke chapter 4, uh, 1 through 13. I'm going to read through this really quickly. Uh, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus said to him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you all the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. Jesus replied, the scripture says, you must uh, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, the scripture also says, uh, you must not test the Lord your God. Uh, when the devil finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And so what's going on here, right? Some people argue that this account is representative of all of the temptations that humanity will ever, will ever face, right? Uh, lust of the flesh, turning bread to stone, uh, lust of the eyes, all, all of this I'll give to you, right? Or uh, pride of the flesh, just toss yourself off and God will take care of you. And, and I'm not going to say that that's wrong because I think that there's probably wisdom in there and there's probably something to be learned in there. There are definitely, those things are definitely in there. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I also will argue that I think we're missing the greater picture, the far deeper meaning if we don't dig just a little bit. And I believe that there's something that's to be said to us in the moment of time that we're living in, uh, in 2022. Um, and to do that, we have to go to right before what happens here, all right? So Jesus is led off into the wilderness, um, and then, but right before, something really important happened, and it was his baptism, all right? And it's in Matthew. We're going to Matthew's account. In chapter 3, it says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him after his baptism. Now, this is, the, this is the part right here. As Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And that phrase, descending like a dove, is super important because we haven't seen that phrase since Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And that says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and the darkness covered the deep water, and the Spirit of God was hovering or descending over the surface of the water. So Jesus' baptism and creation story are linked. All right? They're linked. Now, it's important. Um, well, just as a side note, like that question of like, well, why did Jesus need to be baptized? It was... It was his public declaration of saying, look, if you just watch how I do this, I'm going to live this out correctly in front of you. Just watch me, watch how I live these out, watch what I do, and you'll see what God intended for humanity the whole time, all right? Uh, but the order of his baptism and creation go like this. Will you go ahead and show that? Go like this. Chaos, right? In the creation story, we've got the chaos of, of it, it, it's tovu bohu is what it means. It's like chaotic nothingness right? Over the waters. And in, in, in Jesus' baptism is the chaos of, of being overtaken by an occupying government. Like, we know what that looks like. Like, we're witnessing that on, in real time. And this is the reality that they lived in, right? So you've got all of this chaos. Then you've got water, the waters of the deep in the creation account, the waters of the Jordan River in the Jesus account. Then you have spirit over water, that that descending, that hovering, it's the only two times that ever happens in all of Scripture. It's the same phrase. Then we see God speaking. God speaking over the creation. God speaking over Jesus' baptism. 
And then we see there's an expected order, right? God is ordering creation in the creation account. It's a functional account. God is setting up the function of the cosmos, and there's an expected order. And then the expected order of Jesus is saying, I'm doing this to fulfill all of these things. Watch me, and we're going to see it play out. Then we have testing. In the creation account, we have the testing of what's called the first humans. They fail the testing, and the, uh, the expected order is then no more, and chaos is introduced into the story. If you're a good Hebrew student, like you all would have been, all right, you would have picked up this pattern. Every time we see this pattern happen in Israel's history, there's a failing after the testing, all right? It's not just here. You go to the flood account, all right? You've got these same setups. There's a testing and a failure, all right? When Egypt is, when uh, uh, the Israelites are brought out of Egypt, we see these same things crossing the Jordan River. Every time we see this happening, they knew when this took place that there was going to be a fail. Over and over and over again, uh, there was a failure, except this time, this time Jesus doesn't fail. And so Jesus begins his ministry with the idea of bringing this order to the chaos that's around him, of inviting us into that partnership of living out order or kingdom in our stories, in our chaos. And so for us, we read right past that, and we completely miss the symbolism. We completely miss the deeper context. But for somebody that, was, that knew this, a, Jew, a Jewish reader would have absolutely exploded, like, finally, finally, somebody in all of our history went through this whole thing and didn't fail at the testing, all right? And I think that, uh, that for us, one of the things that we have to realize is that this isn't just a story of Jesus being really hungry and being tempted. This is a story of liberation. This is a story of liberation and of living in the fullness that God has created us to live in, all right? And for us, I think it means a few things. The first thing I think it means is that this, is that our stories don't end in defeat. They don't have to end in defeat, despite the fact that Israel's story continually ended in defeat, all right? After the testing, Jesus showed them how to do it differently, right? He showed them how to do it differently. Um, and I, I don't think it's any different than, I don't think it's any different for us today. Um, even, even if you're not sure about the deity of Jesus, right? Like, even if you're not sure, like, okay, I, I dig what he's saying. I'm not sure he is who he says he is just yet. At least, I, I think that we can all agree that at, at the very least, that we can see the wisdom and the beauty and how Jesus lived out his life in, in light of God's word, right? Like, how he, how he showed us to do it. Like, we can all agree that what he did there was like, okay, I can get that, right? We can see the wisdom in how he lived, uh, how he showed us what it means to be human, how to, how to treat each other, how to love each other, right? Um, and his life, his life shows us what happens um, in the world around us when we live in that way. Uh, he called himself things like uh, the way, the truth, and life. He called himself uh, the door or the gate. He called himself uh, the good shepherd. Um, and our stories don't end in defeat because Jesus is inviting us uh, to do this with him. And so when we partner with him uh, in, in bringing order to all of the chaos that is around us, uh, we are walking the path that is Jesus. All right? When he said those things, it wasn't like some metaphorical or exclude. No, no, no. Anytime we begin that search for God, it is through Jesus that we do that. He is the path that we walk when we do those things. Um, when we reduce Jesus to this, number one, a mascot— or to, like, if, if you had any kind of experience growing up like I did within the church of, like, fire insurance, like this eternal fire insurance, like, just God, you know, just accept Jesus, he's going to save you from hell. And, and we reduce him to those types of things, then we miss this invitation to a, 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 a much deeper and richer life that he has intended for us. In the same, in the same um, uh, verse that Jesus calls himself the gate, we find it in uh, John's account of Jesus' life. He goes on to say this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, and they will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And that phrase that he talks about, that have it to the full, this kind of life, um, is about a certain quality of life. And in the Greek, it's the word uh, uh, perisos. Perisos. What did you call it? Petty sauce? Yeah. Uh, and it means superabundant. 
or superior in quality, all right? So this life that he's talking about isn't about material health or wealth. It's about a certain kind of life. It's a life that brings good fruit to others, right? It's a life that, like, when you're done, people can say, no, 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 this place is better because they lived here, right? And we want to live that out, like, collectively, but also individually. Like, we want Gainesville to say, hey, this place is better because Shift Church, is, their doors are open, like, tangibly better. And this is what Jesus is inviting us into, all right? Um, and when we begin to live out that good fruit, when we begin to live in a way that causes the lives of those around us to be better, then, then we begin to see how that transforms us, but then also transforms our communities around us, right? If I'm living this out, if I'm living this out, then wherever I am is better because I'm there. Not because I'm some whatever, but because of the way that I, the, the quality of the life that I'm living. And so this, this invitation for us is to step into this kind of life and to step out of that chaos and to begin to live this. And we all have those places. Like, we can turn on the news and see it right now, right? Like, you can just, it just is. But we also have those places in our lives that we live out that chaos personally, right? And you're all thinking about them right now, right? And we all have that. And so Jesus is inviting us to step out of that chaos, out of those patterns that have been given to us or that we grew up with or that we invented for ourselves, and to begin to live out this order that we see Jesus living out. Um, and I believe that we, we start all of that by doing two things. Uh, knowing and trusting the story. Like I believe that we begin to live out this idea of order or kingdom out of our chaos if we know and trust the story. Like we have to know it. Like the, the, I hate, 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 hate when people will take the Bible and call it an instruction manual. Or it's the manual for life. It's got all the answers. No, it doesn't. Stop. Listen, the Bible does not have all the answers, okay? It's not meant to have all of the answers. When we try to make it have all the answers, you know what it's going to do? It's going, we have to do, number one, we have to do all kinds of mental gymnastics to make it do that because there's so much it doesn't speak to. But then we also have to set it up as something that it isn't and speaking to things that it's not trying to. Anytime you look at, uh, like, just, I'm going off topic here, but just when you look at things like uh, uh, human origins and, and the Genesis accounts, okay, uh, they don't clash because Genesis isn't speaking to material, ori material origin or the origins of humanity, all right? It's speaking to a theological statement that the, that the post-exilic, the, the Israelites coming out of exile Babylon were stating about themselves. It's a theological treatise, all right? It's not speaking to a scientific account of how and what happened. And when we make it try to, when we take our filters, we talked about this last week, it's in, uh, when we take our filters from our time and place and try to place it over other people's in their time and place and expect them to see things like we do, then that's where we start to see that clashing happen. It doesn't give us all the answers. It is an inspired book, and I do believe it's inspired, but it's inspired collections of stories and historical accounts and poems and psalms, and lamentations, and uh, uh, all of these things put together, uh, letters, tragedies, triumphs, proverbs, all of them wrapped together, right? And it tells us of this story of a God that pursues humanity over and over and over again, and it is the story of humanity's understanding or trying to understand who God is. And that story's not over. That's what it is. But we have to know these things, right? Like we have to, know, I think there's great wisdom in the fact that when uh, the accuser, the enemy came at Jesus, what did he do? He quoted the story back to him. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. To know when those things come up. Do I know the story well enough that if something happens, I can dig into that story and pull out the things that are relevant in the middle of my story? Now, one of the things that, that, um, that we, we will struggle with in this is that uh, rabbis did not teach like Americans love to learn, right? If you're in class, give me the information. Just tell me the answer and how to get to that answer so I know the answer, especially in the, the school system. I mean, they're teaching us to, um, to, to test, right, which is unfortunate. I know so many good teachers are so frustrated. Another topic for another day. 
But we want to, give me the information. Stop beating around the bush. I do this all the time with people. Stop, and I'm the worst about it. Like, I will beat around the bush. But then if you're telling me something, just give me the information. Stop, stop it. But what would happen is, is that rabbis taught that uh, if, like, for example, if truth was uh, in your next-door neighbor's home, right? Like, you're in your house. Truth is here, all right? A rabbi is going to take you all the way through the neighborhood only to bring you back to your neighbor's house because they taught that the discovery of truth was just as important as the truth you discovered. And that there's all kinds, it's like a layer cake, and there's all these layers. There's not just this truth here. There's all of these that are underneath it. And so rabbis taught that way, which would frustrate us, and which is why we have all of these issues with Scripture. Because we're trying to read it through this American lens, and yet they didn't teach the way that our Greek linear thinking works, right? This, this book that we're talking to, this story that we're talking about, is the story of God stepping into the middle of our own stories. And we see that over and over and over of God taking people all the way around the neighborhood to bring them right back to the ne their next door neighbor's house, all right? Uh, we see people winning and losing, right? We see people um, uh, outright uh, moments of joy and celebration and then moments of incredible, deep, pain, anguish, right? Not everybody wins in this story, despite what the American church loves to wrap its arms around. No. There's lots of people that aren't going to win. Bad guys will win all the time. There's an entire book written by a guy named Habakkuk, literally dealing with the fact that bad guys win and it's not fair. That's in there. But it's also the story of all of these people in their moments of joy, in their moments of anguish, crying out to a God that isn't going to fix everything like he's some genie, but then steps into that story and walks every step of the joy or the pain with them. And one of my favorite examples of this, one of my all-time favorite examples of this, is a poem or song written by a man named David. It's found in Psalm 139. It says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, and the English doesn't do very well there, it's Sheol, it's like the land of the dead. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And the man who wrote this, his name is David, understood this in a really deep, intimate way. He, he lived this crazy life where, like, some moments were just like, I mean, he, he, in one moment of celebration, he danced so hard his, his clothes fell off. He just threw off his tunic and he's dancing in his underwear. All right? That's, that's real. And then other moments of David's life were filled with absolute horror and tragedy, some by his own doing and some by the doing of others. And this is a man that understood this idea um, deeply, that if I go to the heavens that I make my bed there, like on the mountaintop, you're there. But if I make my bed in the depths of hell itself, you still haven't abandoned me. God is in our celebration and God is in our personal hells. And that's what it means to bring order to chaos, is that trusting, is, is understanding that faith is trust, trusting that God is in those moments of awesome celebration where we're all throwing this massive party, but also in those moments of hell where you are alone and by yourself and feel like there's nobody with you. That's knowing and trusting the story, knowing that God is there in the good and even more so knowing that in the bad. And that and that somehow, some way, I am not going to stand up here and, and try to, to pretend like I know how all of this works, but that in some way, that God will take all of the things that happen in our life, and if we allow him to, will then bring order out of that chaos. And I don't understand how all of that works. There have been moments in my life where it just, I, I ask the question, why? And the answer never comes. And that's in that moment that I have to choose to trust. Okay, God, I, I don't get it. Number one. Don't, don't mishear me when I say this. I do not believe that everything happens for a reason. Just know that, okay? You, you can argue with me. It's fine. We live in the United States. You have every right to be wrong, but I'm just, I'm kidding. 
But I don't believe that everything happens for a reason. I do believe that God can bring reason to everything that happens. Maybe that's semantics. Maybe that's some mental gymnastics on my part. I'm totally open to owning that. But I'm not going to pretend that I understand all the implications of that or how it even works. I'm just going to trust that God's going to do that in my story. Our stories don't end in defeat when we, when we know and trust the story. Like we can watch, we can see Jesus living this out the proper way and the invitation for us to imitate him as best we can to, to live out that order versus the chaos. Seeing our lives transformed and then seeing the lives of others transformed, um, transforming the communities around us, uh, understanding or trying to understand the, this, this thing that we're, we're on our way to, this journey of Lent, uh, of the sacrifice of Jesus that ends all sacrifices, that, that, that turns, even, even in, even in uh, a moment of, of, of pain, that he flips humanity's power structures upside down and then shows us a different way to do it. Um, and then that giving us... Um, and I would argue, not something that we can't experience outside of him, a piece that, that I just, I don't understand. And so, so this morning, like I, I think it's, it, it's a moment for us to just stop, right? It's just a, a we're continuing on our, our, our path of preparation. Um, and so we come, every week we do this, we come to this time of remembering of how Jesus lived this out, right? That this order that we put up here before, how Jesus showed the Israelites and showed us, shows us today how to live life and the way that we're created to live, to live out this abundant quality of life, a certain kind of life, one that actually impacts those around us, one that makes a difference, one that at the end of our days, people look around and say, no, this place is better because of them. And so we, as like a collective people, like we can look at uh, this story and know that because of this, our stories can be different. That our stories can be different, that, that this story and our stories are intricately intertwined in ways that um, we may never notice or realize. Some ways we can see that it's obvious, and other ways we'll just never even completely understand it. But because of that, that we're invited into this time of remembrance. And so in light of, in light of the story of Jesus living, up, living this order in the middle of his chaos, and the invitation for us to partner with him to do that in our lives, but also in the lives of our communities around us, we come to a time of remembering where we reflect on, are we doing that? Like, am I living this out in a way that brings God's order to creation? Am I partnering with him in the ways that I could? Am I not partnering with him in the ways that I could, right? And so, that, so for the next few minutes, these small symbols, they're in your chairs, these small symbols of body and blood, the body of Christ broken for us, the blood spilled for the New Testament, for the New Covenant, allows us to enter into this larger narrative that is the story of God and his people. And so for the next few moments, anyone that's willing, it's a time of reflection and to examine our hearts in light of the story of Jesus and continue our season of preparation. So let me pray. Father, we thank you for, creator, we thank you for uh, this time together. And Lord, we thank you for how you lived this out in front of us, so that we can, in turn, live it out in our own lives. And so, God, I pray that you would reveal to us this morning just those areas of our life that are still chaotic, um, those, those areas of our lives that are uh, uh, still being lived outside of the order that you brought to us. Um, and so, God, I pray that you would show us those things and help us to see where we can partner with you to bring that order to our lives. And, God, I, I do. I ask... That, that we would be a people that's known um, for the things that we do rather th than uh, an hour on Sunday morning. So that when people think or talk about shift, 
that it's because of something that we did to better this to to better the city um god there are so many things right now that feel overwhelming and so god i pray that that right now we just we just for just a few moments god that we center ourselves around you uh the things that we just heard and the things that we can do as we leave this place god help us to remember uh that sacrifice so that there would be no more uh, that sacrifice that, that brings that peace that we can now enter into, that rest. And God, I, I pray that we would just, uh, Lord, allow us to be in the moment. And it's your name we pray. Amen.